Someone inject that game into my veins. The answer backs come alive in the eighth inning. Alec Thomas hits a monster game tying home run. And now the NLCS is tied. You are locked on Diamondbacks, your daily Arizona Diamondbacks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome into the Locked on Dimebacks podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Listening to who? That was charismatic host of this podcast, Miller Thomas. I'm a multimedia journalist and I'm a graphic designer. So please go check out my website, millerthomas24.myportfolio.com to see all the latest work by me. I've been hosting this podcast since 2020. Now we get to see the D-backs in the NLCS as they just tied up the series. On today's podcast, we'll be talking about things that I really like from this game and adjustments that they need to make heading into game number five. We'll talk about the rematch of the Zacks as well to wrap up the podcast, but we first have to start with the electric game four victory over the Philadelphia Phillies because I was in attendance. I was at this game. I was in right field, literally just two rows back of the fence fantastic seats and I was not that far away from the monster Alec Thomas game tying home run in the eighth inning the D-backs stadium was electric the flip the, the switch was flipped from that point on it was deafening in Chase Field because I have to be honest walking into the stadium watching the game you know just throughout uh Philly fans were pretty loud. Yes, it was definitely mostly D-backs fans in there, but if I had to be honest about the percentage, it was probably like 67, 33 D-backs to Phillies fans. But once Alec Thomas hit that monster home run, you could have told me you could have told me it was 95% D-backs fans in that stadium because everyone was going crazy. The rally towels were flying. I don't know if you can tell. I can barely talk right now because I was screaming so loudly and honestly, a lot of the fans that were sitting near me, there were a good amount of Philly fans surrounding me, but best believe I turned around and I was giving the high fives to every D-backs fan I saw within 30 inches of me because it was just too electric not to Uh, I was screaming at the top of my lungs truly one of the best sports experiences I've ever been to I think it's the first playoff game I've ever been to in any sport so just absolutely electric sold out crowd for the D-backs want the percentage of D-backs fans to be a little bit higher but electric game D-backs really showed you why they've been called the answer backs the you know been called the answer backs all season in this game because they were down five to two in this game at one point you were like are the D-backs going to have enough time to come back in this one and actually win the game they had a bunch of opportunities throughout the game but they, they also squandered some and it was like are they going to get that big hit They weren't really able to get it the first three games of the series. They were able to get some opportunities, get the time run to the plate a bunch of times against the Phillies in the first two games. Of course, they won game three, but walk off fashion. It wasn't like they had 10 runs on the board like the Phillies in game two. So it wouldn't have been a surprise in game four if the D-back just continued to squander their opportunities. And then all of a sudden they were like two for 15 or runners in scoring position and only had two runs on the board despite having so many runners on the bases. But thankfully that didn't happen for the D-backs. They were able to come alive late thanks to the fact that the D-backs are truly living up to their name this postseason as the answer backs because down five to two entering the seventh inning the d-backs once again their offense came alive once the d-backs got to this phillies bullpen i mean it was a bullpen game regardless but once you got later in the innings in this philly to this phillies bullpen the d-backs offense really started to come alive seventh inning you get the bases loaded walk off the phillies rookie reliever and then the eighth inning it felt like some magic might happen because Gur, uh, Lords Guriel starts off that eighth inning with that monster double uh, into the left field corner. And that is off Craig Kimbrell. And once that happens, we're just kind of off to the races. 
Craig Kimbrell had just been so bad for the Philadelphia Phillies this postseason. He blew his first postseason save in that game three walk off to the D-backs. And then what did Rob Thompson decide to do the very next day? Yes, he didn't throw Kimbrell out there in the ninth, but he still threw him out there in a high leverage situation in the eighth inning. And Kimbrell was not able to come through for his team. He was just the the velocity was down for Craig Kimbrell and the D-back just feel like they're seeing Craig Kimbrell better than probably any other pitcher in this uh, on this Philly staff right now. And once Alec Thomas came up to the plate, like I really wanted Alec Thomas to get pinched in this game. One, because I love his walk up song, a Millie. Little Wayne won the best in the game. But also Alec Thomas has been kind of clutch for the D-backs this postseason. Already had a couple of big home runs these playoffs, and we knew he had that pinch hit the other day, and he once again came through for the D-backs, super clutch. This bomb landed in the pool with a splash, dunking on the fans nearby. Alec Thomas, clutch, clutch, clutch home run, and just sparked the crowd after that. Really beautiful stuff by Alec Thomas there. And then, of course, Gabriel Moreno, who I thought had himself a really good game. Uh, He comes through right after Alec Thomas and gives the D-backs the lead. He's two for three with two RBIs and two walks. Gabriel Moreno had himself a fantastic day. D-backs end up going four for 12 with runners in scoring position. Maybe you want to come through a few more times, like a couple more times, but still a 333 average with runners in scoring position. The biggest issue for this D-back offense those first couple games against the Phillies was they weren't creating enough run scoring opportunities right they would sometimes bring the time run to the plate but the dude would always be at like first base or he drew a walk like there wasn't enough extra base hits for the D-backs those first three games there wasn't enough run scoring opportunities for the D-backs those first three games and in this game the D-backs were finally able to have action on the bases it just felt like every other inning the D-backs were doing something The first, you know, early in the game, they were able to get two runs. Then they were able to get their runs later in the ballgame. This game was just sandwiched by D-back scoring in the front end and back end. And it just felt like the D-backs had at least action and opportunities throughout the majority of the ballgame, which is all you want against that Philadelphia Phillies offense. So glad to see the D-backs offense wake up a little bit and also glad to see The D-backs make that Phillies offense manageable in this game because the bullpen, you could have been very scared for a bullpen game, right? The D-backs were throwing out reliever after reliever because you had Mantiply, Frias, Kyle Nelson, Miguel Castro, Sal Frank, Thompson, Ginkle, Seawald. The D-backs threw out eight relievers in this ballgame. I thought for the most part, they did pretty well outside of a couple of the D-backs relievers like Sal Frank and Kyle Nelson. I still thought Ryan Thompson looked pretty good. I still like the way Miguel Castro looked. So I thought the D-backs bullpen did a really good job in a a bullpen game to slow down the Philadelphia Phillies offense. Keep Bryce Harper over three. Great job, I thought, by the pitching staff. I thought they did enough to keep the D-backs within the game and the D-backs offense knowing it was a bullpen game was able to step up to the plate and deliver some really big clutch knocks late in this ball game and now the D-backs have a chance to potentially go up 3-2 in the NLCS and go back to Philadelphia to close it I can't believe the D-backs are actually in this scenario I want everyone to show up to that Saturday game I think I'm going to get tickets and go to game five I think you got to run it back after a super fun a super electric game four how can you not so hopefully you guys get some tickets too and the D-backs are able to take a 3-2 series lead in the NLCS and if you want to win some money this postseason one of the best ways to do that is playing a little daily fancy baseball with the sleep wrap because the MLB playoffs are here, which means the clock is ticking on your chance for up to a hundred times cash on daily fantasy baseball. Baseball has never been more exciting than it is now with studs like Oconia, Betts, and Otani. Pick more or less stats for these stars like home runs, hits, strikeouts, and more for up to 100 times payout on Sleeper. The other reason why I love Sleeper, not just for daily fantasy baseball, 
But also, let's be honest, I love it because the football season is here as well. And I use my sleeper app for my dynasty league. It archives my players from years to from year to year. You can do the rookie draft on there as well. So sleeper is perfect for daily fantasy baseball, dynasty football, make some money. Beat your friends, do whatever you want. Sleeper is great for all that. So use promo code locked on and you'll get up to a hundred dollar match on your first deposit. Terms and conditions apply. See Sleeper's terms of use for details. And don't forget to catch every D backs pitch on their hometown broadcast when you download the Sirius XM app and search up Diamondbacks. All right, all right, all right. Let's get back into the Locked on Diamondbacks podcast. Let's talk about some things that I like from this game four and some adjustments that we need to make heading into game five. I first want to start off by saying I thought it was a good game by Tori Lovello. I think Lovello has really been a weakness for this D-backs team, specifically in this series. The first two rounds of the postseason, I was fine with Tori Lovello. I thought he was good for the most part, probably a BB+. I always have some gripes with Tori Lovello. It's always a love-hate relationship going back to the regular season and the past few seasons. But I thought in this game four, I really want to be fair, Tori Lovello, I thought, earned himself an A on the report card. I felt like he just had a really good pulse on when to pull the relievers, when to keep them in. I thought the strategy was just pretty sound, pretty smart, really played up into the matchups, lefty on lefty, righty on righty, of course. The only time during the game where I kind of questioned Tori Lovello's decision making is when he kept Sal Frank out there to face a Trey Turner. I thought Sal Frank would have been pulled in that moment, ended up leading to some runs. So that was like the only time that I probably disagreed with any decision that Tori Lovello made in this game. But overall, Tori Lovello was really good. I thought the way he picked relievers to go out there was really good. Like I was a little bit surprised. Luis Frias was coming in after Mansply. Like I thought when I saw that, I was like, oh, this Phillies offense might take off right now. Frias might give up some hard contact, but instead that didn't happen. Luis Frias sneakily has been nasty this postseason, has not allowed an earned run. And to be honest, he had two strikeouts tonight. And Luis Frias. We always knew he had nasty stuff. The issue was a lot of the stuff sat in the middle of the zone. It didn't fool anybody, gave up a lot of hard contact. But right now his stuff looks elite. And I want to see a little bit more Luis Frias. I thought maybe the D-backs were going to go with like a Ryan Nelson, a Slay Kakoni after Joe Mantiply came out. But no, they went with Luis Frias. And they even let him pitch into like the second frame, which I thought was Pretty interesting. I didn't know he was going to get like an an extended outing, um, considering he's Luis Frias. But how he's looked this postseason, Tori Lovello gave him a little trust. And like I said, Tori Lovello, all he cared about was the matchups. Most of it worked out. Cal Nelson, lefty on lefty to Schwarber, did give up the home run. But for the most part, I thought Tori Lovello had a great job. And also, the pinch hitters came through for Tori Lovello in a big way. Alec Thomas, of course, we raved about and talked about. I mean, you put him in the game and he hits the game tying home run. Like, you just look like a genius if you're Toy Lovello in that situation. Pinch hitting uh, Alec Thomas for Manny Rivera. Then also, it didn't lead to anything, but he did also pinch hit Tommy Pham for Paven Smith. And Paven Smith came through with a knock. So, (laughs) Toy Lovello might have to ask himself some questions about whether Paven Smith and Alec Thomas should start the next game. We'll talk about that later on the podcast. But Lavello, just want to give him a round of applause. Always a dude that I have a love-hate relationship with, and I just thought he was really good tonight. So shout out Toy Lavello for the game he had against this Phillies team because I thought he really outmanaged Rob Thompson, especially when it came to the bullpen use. And speaking of Rob Thompson, just keep putting Craig Kimbrell out there. The D-backs get opportunities against these other Philly pitchers, but Craig Kimbrell's like the only guy that they're capitalizing on. They did capitalize, I guess, on Jose Alvarado tonight. Is that his name right? Alvarado? But I think Kimbrell is just that dude right now for the D-backs. I doubt that we see him the next game. Who knows? We may never even see him again this series. Like, truly, if you're the manager for the Phillies, why would you put... Craig Kimbrell out there again. Obviously, these D-backs hitters are completely locked in on Kimbrell right now. The velo is down for Kimbrell. He's a guy that used to live in the high 90s, 97, 98, 99 on that fastball. Checking that StatCast scoreboard today, 
fastball was sitting 95, 94, and it seemed to be going down as he threw more pitches. Even tried to take out a Corbin Carroll by hitting him in the leg. Just keep throwing Craig Kimbrell out there because the D-backs just seem like they're going to crush him every time. Speaking of the D-backs offense, I thought they just did a great job of working the count, being patient in this game. We talked about it entering the NLCS, how the D-backs saw the most pitches per plate appearance the whole postseason. And we haven't really seen that those first couple games because those first three games because the Wheelers and the Nolas just have done such a good job of attacking the strike zone, Kaying these D-backs batters and making them speed up because when you attack the zone and throw strikes like it makes the D-backs batters swing the bat and it leads to more balls in play but against the bullpen game this D-backs offense just seemed to be way more patient a bunch of three ball counts a bunch of full counts for this D-backs offense even was able to walk in a run today so I thought the D-backs had really good patience today the guy that I really want to highlight who I thought was really good at the plate we talked about him earlier Gabriel Moreno he's someone throughout the series so far I thought was swing at really bad pitches like in the ground high heat like just typical stuff they shouldn't be swinging at I thought he was being overly aggressive I thought he wasn't waiting for his pitches I just thought tonight a lot more patience out of a Gabriel Moreno he's someone that I thought you know in a couple uh, in a couple spots tonight I was like you know what it, it, Gabriel Moreno might strike out here because that's always done throughout the series but tonight super clutch Moreno, I really loved him tonight. I thought he was really good at the plate, really locked in, and really patient. And of course, Ketel Marte just continues to be amazing. Like, no one is talking about Ketel Marte this postseason. No one's talking about Ketel Marte like he's the best player in the postseason. I feel like there's just not a lot of discussion around him, but his slash line after this game, after going two for four with two runs scored and a walk, 385, 415 OBP, and a 641 slugging, Ketel Marte is that dude in the postseason kevin ginkle and paul seawald once again absolutely filthy once ginkle came in i was like okay d-backs are definitely trying to win this game of course they're trying to win every postseason game but they were down five to two at that point and i were and i just felt like the d-backs offense was going to try and come back or i just felt like the d-backs offense was going to come back seeing ginkle out there like it wasn't one of those outings where you're trying to concede the game already at that point down three runs this D-backs team definitely felt like they were in the ball game throughout I always felt like this D-backs team was in the ball game throughout it when I was watching it even when the D-backs were down five to two entering the seventh I was like you know what it's only three runs it's not the end of the world get a couple guys on and then all of a sudden who knows one swing of the bat can change things I always felt like the D-backs had a chance of coming back in this game. And of course, they did that. And once I saw Kevin Ginkle come in the game, I was like, yeah, D-backs are definitely not trying to allow the Phillies to score any more runs in this game because we're going with our heavy hitters. And once again, Kevin Ginkle and Paul Seawald just absolutely filthy. We had a little scare with Paul Seawald when he gave up that double to Kyle Schwarber, but him and Ginkle have just been so nasty this postseason both of them have not allowed an earned run and Paul Seawald three strikeouts and the save fantastic deal for Mike Hazen to get him at the deadline and Ginkle has turned into the setup man of the future right before our very eyes love that one thing I would like one thing I would love to see heading into the next game An adjustment I would love to see. We got to get Christian Walker a big knock. Of course, he was able to draw the walk that brought home a run with the bases loaded, but he just has not looked good with runners in scoring position. He has not been that great of an offensive player this postseason. I think he only has one home run these playoffs. Like The power just hasn't been there for Christian Walker. He's someone that as a nickname, we call him Crush Shin all the time, right? Because he crushes pitches and... I just don't think he's crushed enough pitches this postseason. I want to see a big Christian Walker knock going forward. So we need to see him let loose a little bit because if he's going to continue to bat in that number four hole, he has to come through more with runners in scoring position or he has to at least deliver one of those classic Christian Walker solo shots. And we haven't really gotten either. So need Christian Walker to match a little bit more what Kyle Schwarber is doing for the Philadelphia Phillies. Then the last thing that I really like from this game that the D-backs have to keep going, keep 
Bryce Harper quiet. He's gone over in Arizona so far. It's been a steady diet of breaking balls and just keeping it low, keeping it away. No elevated heat, really. Just want to stay away from those hot zones with Bryce Harper. And like we saw and like we talked about, he is the engine of that team. He's the catalyst. And all of a sudden, when Bryce Harper's not getting hits, that Phillies offense is isn't as scary so let's keep that going in game five which we're going to talk about in the next segment because man if the d-backs are able to get that game five victory with zach allen on the mound i'm going to feel pretty good with merrill kelly and brandon fott potentially having two shots at sending the d-backs to the world series one thing everyone needs in case of a medical emergency is jace medical because you always want to be prepared in today's world for the uncertainty. That's why the Jace case is a personalized emergency medication kit that contains five essential antibiotics that treat the most common and deadly bacterial infections. You can also customize your case and add additional life-saving medications based on your unique needs. All it takes to get a Jays case is to fill out a simple online form and in some cases jump on a quick call with one of our board certified physicians. Get ongoing care from our physicians on any treatment related questions. Doctor created, doctor recommended. So go to jacemedical.com and enter code locked on at checkout for a $20 discount on your order. That's promo code locked on at J A S E medical.com. All right, all right, all right. Let's get back into the Locked On Dimebacks podcast. Don't forget to catch every D-backs pitch on their hometown broadcast when you download the Sirius XM app and search up Diamondbacks. And if you like the podcast, please follow me on Twitter at CreatorThomas24 for my personal account. Look up Locked On Dimebacks both Twitter and Instagram for the podcast handle. Look up Locked On Dimebacks on YouTube. Hit subscribe there. And of course, we're on all your podcasting platforms. But now let's talk about the rematch, the battle of the Zacks. And we got to wrap this pot up because my voice is going after screen screaming all game four and i hope to continue that trend of screaming at game five saturday and it looks like it's going to be the rematch of the zacks can the d-backs go back to philly up three to two that is the question can zach gallon the d-backs ace lead us to the promised land send us to the second world series in franchise history we haven't been there since 2001 and the d-backs are going to have their best starter on the mound the d-back starter i trust the most right now is probably merrill kelly but the most talented d-back starter they have is zach gallon when he's right he's quite literally unhittable no one can score runs off of him and the d-backs are going to need that Zach Allen, as they're going to potentially win this game five, because Zach Allen, of course, the first time around against this Phillies offense was just not good. And he just flat out has to be better. Last time, five innings, eight hits, five earned runs and three home runs allowed. Excuse me. And if we get that Zach Allen again, the D-backs have no chance in this game. I don't think the D-backs can win another game against the Phillies. And Zach Allen gives up three home runs and then five or more runs. Like, I think we're going to need good Zach Allen for the D-backs to be in position to win the game Saturday. And when you look at who is on the other side for the Phillies, like right now, the better Zach is Zach Wheeler. Zach Allen had a couple good starts in the postseason, but then ran into a buzz all, a buzz saw when he faced this Phillies offense. And for Zach Wheeler, he has yet to face a buzzsaw in his postseason career, or maybe the buzzsaw sees Zach Wheeler. Now, I don't know what stops a buzzsaw. Would you just say, like, really, really thick metal? I don't know what Zach Wheeler is, but he's something that stops the buzzsaw because when you look at Zach Wheeler's postseason game log, it, it's just fantastic. Only two of his nine postseason starts weren't quality starts and i'm gonna go through his game log real quick in the postseason because it's nasty 6.1 innings pitch no earned runs six innings pitch three earned runs seven innings pitch no earned runs six innings pitch no uh six innings pitch two earned runs five innings pitch four earned runs okay bad that was against the houston astros in the world series 
5.1 innings pitch, two earned runs. 6.2 innings pitch, one earned run. 6.1 innings pitch, two earned runs. Six innings pitch, two earned runs. Those are his nine starts. So only he has one start where he's allowed more than three earned runs. And even in the start where, where he allowed three earned runs, he still went six innings. So it, it was still a quality start. So for the D-backs, you're going to have to figure out how to stop Zach Wheeler Wheeler has just been one of the best postseason pitchers of all time. He just is so dominant and locked in, and his put-away stuff is just so nasty, and the D-backs were just getting rung up repeatedly in that game one against Zach, uh, against Zach Wheeler, who had eight strikeouts through six innings pitch. I thought the D-backs were able to get to him a little bit that third time through the lineup, but I think it was too late at that point. I don't know if the D-backs offense can't knock it. I don't know if this D-backs offense can knock Wheeler out the game early via just a lot of offensive production, but I do think the D-backs can at least do what they did in game four and be patient. I think the most important thing for this D-backs offense to be in game five is patient. Work the count. Don't be afraid to take a strike. Wheeler's going to throw strikes, but don't be afraid to take one. Wait for that pitch if you want to. Of course, if you have two strikes, in the count, you're going to have to protect the plane, probably swing a little bit more, but don't be afraid to take that first pitch strike. I want to see that pitch count for Wheeler up because he's just been so dominant in his postseason career. I think we're going to have to run that pitch count up to get Wheeler out the game. And then if you're able to do that, the Phillies just had a major bullpen game like the D-backs. They're going to need some rest. They're not going to want to throw a Kimbrel out there again. So getting Wheeler out the game could be critical for this D-backs offense, but the same point's going to be the same point's going to be made on locked on Phillies getting Gallon out the game early, right? So you could get to that D-backs bullpen that is also overworked after that game four. Like both of those teams are going to need their starters to step up, and whichever starter is better between the two Zacks, that team is probably going to win. I think this is a huge game where the pressure is going to be on the gallons and the wheelers to pitch like aces and whichever ace is better. I think that team will win. We're going to need gallon to be on point. Now I'm not afraid for gallon to get yanked early because I thought he should have been yanked in like the third inning of a star against the Phillies because the D backs two dudes that they didn't use in this bullpen game was a Ryan Nelson and a slate Kakoni. And so if gallon does need to get if Gallon does need to be yanked early because he starts giving up runs and hard contact, I wouldn't mind turning to a Slay Kakoni to get us maybe three innings out the pen. We'll see how it goes. That would be the only way for the D-backs ace to struggle and the D-backs still have a chance to win. You just have to pull Gallon if he really starts to look bad early and go with like a Slade. I, I just wouldn't trust a Ryan Nelson in that game. I don't know who from the D-backs bullpen um, – will even be like rested enough to go tomorrow. Like a Ryan Thompson after pitching two innings in game four, would you trust him to go the next game? I don't know. I think you still ride the Ginkles and the Seawalds because they didn't really do anything the first two games of the series. But I don't know about the Thompsons and the South Franks. I think needs to sit for game five. I just don't like the way South Frank looks right now. Like I said earlier in segment number two, Luis Frias is the guy sneakily that I would like to see a little bit more this postseason because he's been so nasty for the D-backs. I think for tomorrow, it has to be a low scoring game, and I think it will be. I think it's going to be the two aces really battling out. I think it's going to be like game three where you're going to need some offense late in the game. and Hopefully the D-backs have an opportunity to give themselves a big knock and put themselves ahead. And who knows if you can get to that bullpen in like the fifth or sixth inning, I think the D-backs offense is going to have a good chance to put some runs on the board. But I need to see more D-backs fans at the game on Saturday. First, go to the Arizona Coyotes home opener and then go to the D-backs fans. Do a little uh, a little double header for Arizona sports. First home game of the season for the Coyotes. Then you get to watch NLCS game five. D-back take a 3-2 series lead. A perfect Arizona sports day. So go do that. I want to see the D-backs heading back to Philly with a series lead because then all of a sudden you get Merrill Kelly to potentially close out game six. Then I'm even open-minded to Brandon Fott getting it done in game seven. I feel like if you went back down, I feel like if you go back to Philly down three, two, the D backs are getting wrapped up in six. But if the D backs go 
to Philly up 3-2. Of course, they can still lose the series. But I feel a lot more confident in the D-backs and their chance to win the series, of course, if they're up and leading in a series as opposed to being down. But I think the whole momentum and tenor of the series is just going to change if the D-backs lose the final home game that they have and then go back to Philadelphia down 3-2. I would rather see those Philly fans and the Philly players on their heels in their home ballpark and having to win two games to knock off the D-backs in front of your home fans and not blow it. Yeah, D-backs will be playing with house money at that point if they're going back into Citizens Bank ballpark with a lead. Everything will be gravy for the D-backs. Of course, you're trying to win the game and go to the World Series, but there will just be so much pressure on the Phillies to not lose home games knowing you're down in a series. So I would just love to see that pressure on the Philadelphia Phillies, and let's make sure we get that Game 5 victory on Saturday. Now, that's it for this edition of the Locked on Dimebacks podcast. Come back tomorrow for more Dimebacks news coverage inside because I'll probably do a little, little mini pod instant reaction after the D-backs beat the Phillies in game five. So come back, come back for that. Thank you for making Locked on Dimebacks your first listen every day. If I don't do a game five reaction, I might only do if the D-backs win. Uh, And, you know, if they win game five, I don't know if I want to talk if they lose game five. So if you don't hear from me Saturday, come back next week for more Dimebacks news coverage insight. And as always, stay safe, stay healthy. Doses.